जय राम कुंज विहारी
So this is chapter 9, The Most Confidential Knowledge, text number 30, which is one of the most mysterious verses in the entire Bhagavad Gita. And it's a very lengthy purport, so we'll try to do something. Apichat sudaracharo Bajate mam mananyabak Sarvevar samantavya Samya vyavya sito hisa Apichat sudaracharo Bajate mam mananyabak Sarveva samantavya Samya vyava sito hisa Apichat sudarachar ho Bajate mam mananyabak Sarveva samantavya Samyak Vyava Sito Hisa Hmm. 
be? Even. Chet? If. Sudra Chara. One committing the most abominable actions. Vajite is engaged in devotional service. Mum, unto me. Ananya Bhak, without deviation. Sadhu, a saint. Eva, certainly. Sa, he. Matavya, to be considered, is to be considered. Samyak, completely. Vivyastita, situated in determination. He, certainly. Saha, he. So, even if one commits the most abominable action, if he's engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his de determination. Very mysterious verse. And even the great demigods could not figure the real import of this verse, but Bhakti Vinod Thakur has discovered it. So, so purport, the word Sudara Chara used in this verse is very significant, and we should understand it properly. When a living entity is conditioned, he has two kinds of activities. One is conditional, and the other is constitutional. So uh, what is conditional and what is constitutional? What does that mean? Very easy. Well, conditional is our false ego, and uh, constitutional is our legal identity. Yeah. Good way to describe it. One's material, one's spiritual. Conditional activities or material activities, constitutional activities or spiritual activities. As for protecting the body or abiding by the rules of society and state, certainly there are different activities, even for devotees, in connection with the conditional life, and such activities are called conditional. Okay, so things that are connected to the body, society and state, in other words, external, they're conditional, they change. Besides these, the living entity who is fully conscious of his spiritual nature is engaged in Krishna consciousness or devotional service to the Lord as activities which are transcendental. Such activities are performed in his constitutional position, that means your spiritual position, and they're technical, technically called devotional service. Now, in the conditioned state, sometimes devotional service and conditional service in relationship to, a, to the body will parallel one another. Mm. As far as possible, devotee is very cautious that he does not do anything that could disrupt his wholesome condition. Mm. In other words, when you are very much act active in devotional service, sometimes you are also connecting with the material energy just by, by being uh, active around the body and social activities. So that means you have to be careful. <laughs> it's like handling a, you know, a hot iron. If you don't handle it, if you hold it in the wrong place, you'll get burned. <laughs> Sometimes, however, it may be seen that a person in Krishna consciousness commits some acts which may be taken as abominably socially or abominable socially or politically. Hmm. But such a temporary fall down does not disqualify him. So one is engaged in devotional service and he's in his constitutional activities. He's acting in his 
conditional activities, he commits something that is not acceptable in the conditional activities, and he may experience some fall down. But that doesn't disqualify him in his practice of devotional service. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated that if a person falls down but is wholeheartedly engaged in transcendental service to the Lord, the Lord being situated within his heart, purifies him and excuses him from that abomination. So we've seen in our society, when somebody does commit some bad activity, uh, sometimes we throw them out. Just like there was an example where the devotees, under the guidance of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, was building a temple in one area. So they were working, and uh, Bhakti Siddhanta came to inspect the work. So he asked about one brahmachari who he, he didn't see there. So the, the devotee said, well, that brahmachari, he got involved with this lady, and so we had to reprimand him, and then he left. Bhakti Siddhanta said, I'm not interested in building any temple here. It's more important that we take care of devotees. It takes 300 gallons of blood to make one devotee. And therefore, uh, you know, we have acted wrongly by chastising him and causing him to go away. So the devotees were concerned, and so they said, all right, Maharaj, we'll bring him back. And so they did, they brought him back, and then Maharaj was happy. So, in other words, when one commits a wrong activity, he should be dealt with in the right way, but not so much that he wants to leave or wants to stop his devotional activity. Because uh, that happened to many times in our society when somebody does something materially abominable, such as then, you know, sometimes a devotee gets involved with another person's wife, and uh, so, and everything is found out, so he goes away, and nobody ever sees him again. And then there was one very senior devotee who was a sannyasi. He got involved with a lady, and uh, so the devotees made it public what was going on. And Prabhupada got very angry at the devotees for making it public. He said, now you've made it impossible for him to come back. And so then Prabhupada made some arrangements and he brought him back. He said, don't go away, stay with us. Just now you can become a good grihasta, engage in devotional service, and nothing is lost. So this is how sometimes we get too heavy when somebody makes a mistake and uh, and then we chastise them, or we do, we broadcast their mistakes, and we cause that person to not want to come in the association of the devotees again because of that. That's a very sensitive matter, so one should be very careful on how one deals with someone who falls down or deviates for s in some reason. It's not that it's all right that they do that, but how we deal with it is the important factor to not to allow them to go away from Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. And here it says, one if one engages in f temporary fall down, it does not disqualify him. In the Srimad Bhagavatam it is stated, one is who wholly engaged in transcendental service being situated, the Lord's being purifies him and excuses him from the abomination. The material contamination is so strong that even a yogi fully engaged in service to the Lord sometimes becomes ensnared. But Krishna consciousness is so strong that such an occasional fall down is at once rectified. Mm. Um, we see, you know, we have the example of Vishwamita Muni who was performing great yogi, great devotional, not devotional service, but yoga austerities, and was attracted by a society girl. 
Therefore, the process of devotional service is always a success. One should not deride a devotee for some accidental fall down from the ideal path. For as explained in the next verse, such occasional fall downs will be stopped in due course as soon as the devotee is completely situated in Krishna consciousness. So the idea is to keep the devotee in Krishna consciousness and give him a chance to get the higher taste again. And then all his activities are, uh, again, he's situated rightly and it's like it never happened before. Therefore, a person who is situated in Krishna consciousness is engaged with determination in the process of chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, should be considered to be in the transcendental position, even if by chance or accident he is found to have, to, uh, found to have fallen. The word sadhu eva, he is saintly, are very emphatic. They are a warning to the non-devotees that because of an accidental fall down, the devotee should not be derided. He should still be considered saintly, even if he has accidentally fallen down. So Prabhupada keeps repeating this point. And the word mantavya is still more emphatic. If one does not follow this rule and derides a devotee for his ac accidental fall down, then one is disobeying the order of the Supreme Lord. The only qualification of a devotee is to be unflinchingly and exclusively engaged in devotional service. The Sringa Purana speaks, Bhagavati cha ya varanya che ka brisan malipi vijate manusyaha nahi sasa kalusha cha bi kadachit Timira parabhava tam upaite chandraha. The meaning is that even if one fully engaged in devotional service of the Lord is sometimes found engaged in abominable activities, these activities should be considered like to be spots that resemble the mark of a rabbit of a, on the moon. Such spots do not become an impediment to the diffusion of moon moonlight. Similarly, the accidental fall down of a devotee from the path of saintly character does not make him abominable. The problem is when one does fall down, he doesn't want to again associate with devotees, he wants to go away. And that can be a, a problem. On the other hand, one should not misunderstand that a devotee in a transcendental service can act in any kinds of abominable ways. So this is not an excuse for acting wrongly. This all verse refers to an accident due to the strong power of material connections. Devotional service is more or less a declaration of war against the illusionary energy. As long as one is not strong enough to fight the illusionary energy, there may be accidental fall downs. But when one is strong, strong enough, he is no longer subjected to such fall downs as previously explained. No one should take advantage of this verse and commit nonsense and think that he is still a devotee. <laughs> if he does not improve his character by devotional service, then it is, not to, it is to be understood that he is not a high devotee. Mm. Mm. So the idea is to keep people in devotional service and let them get purified because that's the only rectification. The idea is called, pers what is that, pratishta? Not pratishta, but, uh, huh? Uh, no, uh, where is it? It's in the fifth, it's in the beginning of the sixth canto, the end of the fifth canto. Praschitya, praschitya. Praschitya means atonement. Yeah, price chitya means atonement. That means the only atonement for fall downs is again to get back up in devotional service like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not that one should, uh, what we say, criticize, 
So there is a very interesting point here. Omagyan timiran nasya gina jana sakaya chaksu namitamena tasmai shi guru vena maha shri prabhupada ki jai. The point is, when the verse says, even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is considered to be saintly because he is properly situated in devotional service. That refers to two people, not just the person who considers, not, not just the person who acts in the wrong way, but the person who sees the action also. Hmm. And that's what Bhakti Vinod Thakur revealed to the assembly of the demigods. When they called him to get an understanding of this verse, he appeared to them and spoke that this means that one who sees another person as being saintly, although he has fallen down, he is also saintly. Because if you see him as being unsaintly, that means you're not seeing properly because devotional service has nothing to do with the external energy. So if one somehow or other connects with the external energy and causes some wrong activity to be performed, the, the only prasthitya, atonement, is again engaged in devotional service. So unfortunately, and maybe this is the growing pains of our society, is that when somebody does fall victim of maya, um, we get we make it difficult for them to get back up in devotional service by finding some criticism, by speaking some gossip, by getting on the internet and broadcasting all this stuff, or by coming to the person and chastising him for wrong behavior. So um, the first part point is here is that uh, these fall downs are accidental. Now there's another thing, if a person is actually acting wrongly and doesn't think it's wrong, that doesn't apply here. And then that person should be corrected in order, because that activity has to stop. Otherwise, even if they engage in devotional service, they will lose the mercy because it's like pouring water and on the fire and while you're trying to light the fire at the same time. It's not possible. So therefore one has to stop those wrong activities. So this talks about accidental fall downs. Uh, the seventh offense to the holy name is to commit sinful activities on the strength of chanting of the holy name. Prabhupada speaks about this point as those who think that knowing that the holy name is very powerful and can relieve one of the uh, reactions of sinful activities and offenses, that one can go about acting in a way that is wrongly. In other words, let me engage in some illicit activity, let me engage in some, some, some activity that is prohibited in devotional service and I'll just chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and then I'll be okay. And no, because Krishna and his name are non-different, and therefore Krishna's mercy will not be available even if they chant, because it's done purposely. That, that's why that's called nam nam, nam nam yasya hi bap papa budhi, nam yam yasya, nam yam bala yasya hi papa budhi, nam na bala, bala means a uh, great sinful activity to purposely commit something wrong. But here we're talking about accidental. Accidental. And because mm, devotees, well, we are so, so, so easily connected to the material energy, just like a lot of devotees who have been preaching Krishna consciousness, find themselves preaching to women many times. And so in that preaching, they sometimes find themselves getting attracted to the opposite sex. It's done because they're doing their preaching work and sometimes they actually give up their practice or they give up their ashram and then take to the, uh, you know, take to another ashram because they were attracted. So one has to be careful in association with the material energy because material energy 
is what is called um, uncertain. We don't know. Never, one should never think that I'm, I'm free from the attraction of the material energy. Thinking like that leads one to uh, becoming victimized by the material energy. One should be, always be careful. Being careful means keeping your consciousness in the right uh, towards Krishna at all times because at any moment Maya can come and fool you. A lot of times devotees take what seems to be Krishna conscious but is not and therefore they get victimized by that. You know. I can tell you one kind of light-hearted story it was tell, told by my god brother who is a very senior devotee in Krishna consciousness, a sannyasi guru. So he had one disciple and um, the disciple he, uh, he had a, a girlfriend who he gave up many years ago when he came to Krishna consciousness. But then she contacted him and said, can I meet you? Mm -hmm. So he was thinking, hmm, yeah, I'll just meet her. So it was in the evening time, which is not a really a good time to meet ladies. <laughs> so he did. And... Um, so he was talking, and they were talking, and whatever they were talking about. And then after some time, she left. Mm -hmm. And so he was so enthusiastic to, and he was feeling like, well, you know, I was like Haridas Thakur with the prostitute. I didn't get at all affected by it. So he told his spiritual master the story. His spiritual master told him, what a fool you are. How many times did you fall down in your mind? <laughs> yeah, and so he took, he was thinking, well, you know, nothing really happened, but it did. But it was on the mental platform. So one, if one thinks, well, I'm so spiritually strong that I can act like Srila Haridas Thakur or uh, Lord Nityananda or somebody, who's an exalted personality, and think I won't be affected by material energy, then one may be in for a surprise. <laughs> because as, ba as Srila Prabhupada writes, and as Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati talks about, and the scriptures also say, never trust your mind. <laughs> Always distrust it, because it can cause you to think in the wrong way and which will lead to wrong actions. So one should always carefully got, take, take notice of the mind by the intelligence. And the intelligence should be nourished by scripture and by guru. So if you're connected to the scripture and guru through the intelligence, then you can be careful and keep that mind from acting and thinking in the wrong way. So one has to be very careful. But the strength we get in, in our Krishna consciousness is good japa, mm -hmm. strong sadhana. Here's where our strength comes. Mm -hmm. Even if we are struggling with japa, it doesn't matter. But if you're working to improve your japa and staying steady in your sadhana, then gradually you will gain the strength to overcome the dictations of the restless mind which is always causing us to think differently than Krishna consciousness. That's the nature of the mind. It's filled with so many thoughts, desires, and various types of plans how to become happy. <laughs> yeah, right? The mind is like that, always telling you, well, all you have to do is make this plan and you'll be happy. <laughs> but as it says, the mind is a non-devotee. Uh, that means uh, one should not associate with a non-devotee because a non-devotee can cause us to, again, take up material activities. So one should make your mind a devotee by preaching to your mind. So we have the example of Raghunath Das Goswami. He wrote Manashiksha, one of the most powerful scriptures, and mana shiksha means instructions to the mind. 
and there's 11 verses with one Valastuti, which is the 12th verse. In that, he talks to his mind, he preaches to his mind. He conjoles his mind, he criticizes his mind, he praises or glorifies his mind. He does different things to approach his mind so his mind will listen to what he has to say. <laughs> so Mother Six is a very uh, powerful scripture and it reveals the, the hidden, subtle factors that are there within the mind in order to somehow or other push us back towards material um, thoughts and activities. Sometimes it looks like, and many times it looks like, devotional service. So be careful and always keep your mind, watch, watch your mind and always make sure you direct your mind towards Krishna. That's the idea. The mind has to be directed as a, as a restless child has to be guided so it doesn't do the wrong thing or break something or hurt itself. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to recognize the activities of the mind and where it's taking us like that. And, if it, and the idea is to bring it on us towards Krishna and devotional service like that. But it's not so easy. <laughs> it's not so easy to control the mind because many of the thoughts that come from the mind are due to uh, desires that we've had for many, many millions of lifetimes that are still coming to the surface in different forms. So here, in the, in the, that way we will be free from the tendency to commit wrong activities because maya is very subtle and as we understand maya knows where you are weak. And this is the point. She knows exactly your weak spot. And like a fighter who is fighting in a boxing ring, you know boxing? So if you're fighting and you hit somebody in a, in a certain spot and that causes that person to have some bruise or some blood, then the fighter thinks, let me hit that spot again because that's the weak spot. <laughs> so now Maya knows your weak spot, whatever it is. Everybody has a weak spot and she hits you there. Why she does that is to help to remind you that this is where your weak spot is and you should cover it and become strong again in that area. So, uh, but if you're not, then you'll be victimized by Maya's attacks, like that, whatever your weak spot is. We all have weak spots, but we can overcome that um, through carefully understanding where we are weak and working on to strengthen that through sadhana and through the mercy of the Lord, praying for the mercy of the Lord. Okay, so we'll end here. As it says here, we should end by 7.45. So, is there any comments or questions? Or Uh, I wonder, you mentioned, and thank you very much for nice lecture, first of all. Hmm? Thank you very much for nice lecture, first of all. Oh, okay. So I wonder, is you mentioned like uh, this Manasi, Manasi Shiksha, talking to the mind. What does this mean? This is like talking to the mind, like praying to the Lord? Like no, no, he, he, talk, he addresses his mind as another person. My dear mind, <laughs> why are you uh, finding happiness in, you know, hearing about the faults of others? <laughs> you are simply, simply drinking donkey urine. <laughs> he says that, donkey urine. False prestige, duplicity, 
wrong association. Why do you do that, mind? Give it all up. So it's a series of instructions to the mind. But sometimes he gets heavy with the mind and sometimes he speaks very sweetly to the mind. Because you can't just keep heavy out, if you heavy out your mind all the time, then your mind will just run away. But if you talk sweetly to it, my dear mind, don't you know we are in this process together? So you can be happy if you follow Krishna consciousness. I know you have your own ideas, and we've tried many of your own ideas, and a lot of times we see they don't work. So why don't you try my idea, which is Krishna's idea, and see, we will both become happy, especially you. Well, that's an example of how you could talk to your mind. <laughs> but if you think you're your mind, then you're a that's a problem. <laughs> if you think I'm the mind, then that's, that's wrong, because we're not the mind, we're not the body. The, the mind is just a subtle part of the material body. That's all. So, you can read those prayers. It's called Manashiksha. You can find them. Raghunath huh? Das Goswami. Yeah, Raghunath Das Goswami. Yeah. Manashiksha. And uh, my god sister, Irmala, she published a book called Manashiksha. And in that book, um, she includes uh, lectures on these, on each of the verses given by Sachinandana Maharaj, by um, Bhakti Vigyan Swami Maharaj, Shivaram Swami herself, and one or two lectures by Jayadvaita Swami. So, and she goes through verse by verse, and she includes Bhakti Vinodhar Kaur's statements regarding this about each of the verses because he, he takes the, the verse from two perspectives um, I can't remember the, how those perspectives are categorized but he is explaining these what these verses actually mean and some principles that make up the process of overcoming these anarthas it's good. Uh, it's a it's a big book. It's like this. It's you know, but it's interesting, and you can read the commentaries by the different devotees, including Bhakti Vinoda, of course, commentaries. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting book. It's a book you can study. Uh, we gave a seminar on it. Zagreb many years ago. I remember I studied it in order to give it the seminar. And found it, and we took much notes on the book, on the verses, it's interesting. It's probably one of the king of all, all scriptures outside of the actual revealed scriptures. It's one of the most interesting uh, treatises. And then the last few verses take you to Vrindavan. He takes the mind to Vrindavan. The glorification of Radharani, the glorification of Sanatana Rupa Goswami, the glorification of Vrindavan, the glorification of Krishna, glorification of the cows. And then the last three or four verses are pretty much are in the mood of Vrindavan. What is the name of the book again? Mana, M-A-N-A-H, Mana Shiksha, S-I-K-S-A. Shiksha means instructions and Mana means mind, instructions to the mind. Mm -hmm. But this is from Raghunath Das Goswami. Yeah, Raghunath. Yeah. What about this from uh, Udmila Mataji? She put the book together. She took the, the commentaries of Bhakti Vinod Thakur mm -hmm. and added the lectures given by herself and the devotees I mentioned and made a book out of it. 
So they're mostly lectures on each of the verses. Not every devotee comments on every verse. Sati Nanda Maharaj on some of the verses, Sri Ram Maharaj on a few of the verses, Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj on mostly all of the verses. So you'll find she simply took their lectures and added to the book as part of the explanations on each of the verses. Interesting. It's an interesting read. But when you read the verses, they're quite interesting. <laughs> they're really interesting. Uh, the deficiencies of the pious householder, the deficiencies of the devotee householder, and the not deficiencies, deviations of the pious householder, deviations of the devotee householder, deviations of the sannyasi. You know, Vinayana you know, Sannyasi is, you know, simply striving for name and fame and followers. And that's a fault out. He's trying to get more followers, he's trying to get more disciples, better position in the society. And then that's that's a deviation from the ashram. And he points that out. That's one of them. Mm -hmm. That one I remember. One more thing, uh, I, I heard correctly, you mentioned that Bhaktivinoda Kaur, he preached uh, on some assembly of demigods. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a real mystical experience. He explained this verse we did tonight. He said they couldn't understand, the demigods called him, and they couldn't understand what this verse meant. So he gave the explanation. And the explanation, I have that on, I have that as a file, I have it written, it's written out. I have the whole discourse between the demigods and him. And what was concluded as he said that not only does the person who commits the abominable activity, but the person who witnesses it, he becomes saintly. That's what this verse means. That's the hidden meaning of the verse. Those who see the person who falls down because he's in devotion and devotional service, that person who sees that become and doesn't criticize that becomes saintly. He criticizes that he's not saintly. He sees, oh, this person has fallen down, but he's in devotional service then that person who sees that, he's become saintly. That was Bhaktivedanta Thakur's message to the demigods. And they thanked him for that, which gave the conclusion of this whole verse. Mm -hmm. But this assembly happened uh, in uh, meditation or how? Or I'll have to read it again. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's a, yeah, I think it was in the meditation, mm -hmm. but it's, but I'll, I'll uh, next time I'm sitting on this little seat here, I'll give you the answer. <laughs> it's not so important, but it's really interesting. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I was going to read it tonight before I came, but uh, I didn't have time, so I hadn't, hadn't read it in a, lo a while. But I'll go back and read it because I want to find out more, too. <laughs> Is Ananta here? He's, he's on the altar. Oh, he's on the altar. Oh, okay. Yeah, I heard his voice <laughs> with that famous laughter. <laughs> no, it just gives gives it gives us very good feelings. Okay, so yeah. Thank you for your points, but I would suggest, and I think you'll find it interesting and very uh, spiritually edifying if you read that book on Mahashiksha. 
it's kind of a kind of book when you start it, you realize, wow, this is this is a jewel. <laughs> it's really got a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, it's interesting that just yesterday, Lid Govinda Prabhu came to my room and he was talking about this book to me. Really? Is it? Lid Govinda. The same, this book, yeah. Same book, huh? Did you read it? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaur